Welcome to Super Context, a podcast autopsy of media. How we consume it and how it informs our everyday culture. I'm Christian Sager, a writer and a designer. And I'm Charlie Bennett, a librarian and a radio raconteur. Each episode is us trying to understand the entertainment world that we all live in just a little bit better. Today's episode is about Lone Wolf and Cub. This epic 1970s manga series by Kazuo Koike and Goseki Kojima is celebrated for its influence on other stories. We look at the conditions that produced it and how the comic represents Japanese history, revenge, gender, and the irredeemable hero on the road to hell. You can follow him to patreon.com slash supercontext where you can check out show notes, leave a comment, or you can email us at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com. When did you start reading Lone Wolf and Cub? And did you finish? So you know the 90s are really important to me, Chris. <laughs> Check one on the bingo box. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so the reason I bring that up is because I, I was looking at the research for today's episode. Yeah. And some of the years weren't matching up for me from my memories of things. Okay. I ended up having to go back and tracking down like when did Road to Perdition come out? You know? I, when did I I'm when did I guess take that, that was like early 2000s? Yeah. When did I take that postmodernism class? Right? When did I read Dark Knight Returns? All these things. Okay. <laughs> Cuz I had to put together my personal history of like when did people start saying, "Oh yeah, Lone Wolf and Cub, that's a really good comic." Uh-huh. Yeah. And it was definitely, it was my buddy, Mark, who talked about them, uh, the comics, I mean. And there was also like the floating connection of Ghost Dog and right. just, you know, Samurai being cool, right? And Ronin being super cool. And you have like a pretty intense interest in Kurosawa stuff. Yeah. Um, but the Kurosawa stuff, I didn't, until only recently, I just had no sense of actual Japanese history and culture. Okay. I certainly have a sense of the, the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, exaggerated, colorful carnival version of Japanese culture that is now kind of a meme, you know, for the, uh, American internet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what was it? It was, um, somebody made a joke online about how, Oh yeah, I'm so big in Japan. They're going to start selling my uh, soiled underwear in vending machines. And someone else made the comment of that happened for three months in the early '90s in Japan, and you are still making jokes about it. Wow. And okay. I thought, I mean, I don't know what <laughs> part of those are true. I was just like, yeah. oh right, I have a bullshit version of Japan in my head. Yeah, like like your version of Japan is lost in translation. Literally yeah. and figuratively. You know, Lost in Translation is probably more real than most of my versions <laughs> of Japan in my head. My my cyberpunk Ridley Scott faux Yakuza, you know, Takashi Miike cartoon yeah. of Japan. So that's actually a really uh, good way for us to start talking yeah. about this because I think for a lot of Americans, well, not even a lot of Americans, I think for the Americans who are paying attention to Japan, most of... Their understanding is through pop culture. I think it has to be unless you study the language, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so I will cop to this. I uh, studied Japanese for one year in college. I had a intro to Japanese class that I took Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. every day my freshman year, which was a bad decision. Yeah, I bet that didn't go well <laughs> mentally or physically. None of them went well, especially because I worked nights. So, yeah, so I took that class and I technically learned Japanese and then immediately forgot Japanese after that year. Yeah. And even taking that class, I don't think gave me an actual understanding of Japan. Like the closest I've been to understanding Japan is that same year I had a long layover in Narita airport and I was like, Oh, this is very different. And, <laughs> and, uh, Oh, and my Japanese is coming in handy, you know? 
Yeah. I think all of all of what I just sort of laid out in a kind of joke, but you know, joking on the square, uh, it all came together for me in the reading of Lone Wolf and Cub Volume Two. Because I did continue after reading Volume One for this episode. Okay. And a lot of what's in Volume Two is uh, philosophical monologues built into the stories as yeah. opposed to the real scene setting stuff that's in the first uh, volume. And the idea of nothingness, the idea of empty thought and of absence of self. Uh, and I'm, I'm making a mockery of the actual philosophical terms, both Eastern and Western. But these are all deeply uh, embedded in those monologues because they're deeply embedded in Eastern culture and thought. And I've been reading philosophy and listening to a philosophy podcast and, you know, recently hit the Heidegger and the Sartre stuff, you know, and uh, and Eugene Thacker is all about darkness, blackness, the horror of philosophy, the inability to connect to nothing, and et cetera. And I just had this. I called it cultural vertigo because I realized suddenly, oh, there's an entire history, thousands of years of history of thought that places a very, I'll say simple concept because it is a straightforward, you know, nothing. That's an easy concept to begin to try and uh, engage. Um, a very simple concept has been developed in a completely different thread than my understanding mm -hmm. and my half ass sense of, Oh yeah. You know, the Japanese people or Japanese history that comes from pop culture, third or fourth hand kind of renditions is, uh, it would be insulting if I pretended that it meant anything. Hmm. Okay. So that is probably a really awkward place for us to start talking about this 50 year old manga series. But it will do well, our I, best. I think there's an easy segue. Yeah. Um, it was really nice to get a much more sort of source genre material from Japan. Uh huh. As opposed to a, you know, layer, uh, layers of influence material. Well, I'll agree with you on that because that's one of the reasons why I really was drawn into this series. I started reading it. And I really enjoyed it, but I realized that it's it's like what you were saying, that I felt like I was getting, with each volume, a as close to an illustrated history of Japan as I was going to get. Right. And that the way in which the story is told and the way in which the art is depicted is almost meditative. And there's kind of a, a quality to reading Lone Wolf and Cub for me. It's a lot like it's a lot like how people talk about watching cooking shows that like they're Whoa. able to just kind of watch and and sort of no longer be in themselves. They just like are relaxed okay. by the process of watching other people prepare food. And uh, Lone Wolf and Cub works like that for me in a way that most comics don't. I don't know exactly how to describe how it works for me. It is a little bit like watching uh, Westerns made in the seventies mm -hmm. and understanding, Oh, America is being processed culturally in a very particular way through, um, the genre and, and sort of popular popularized history of quote unquote cowboys. Mm. And then being able to recognize this is Japan being processed through a genre history. Yeah at that moment. And oh. that's a very powerful sort of, um, uh, relaxing realization about, yeah. uh, an epic. Yeah. I think the, the main difference is that this is more historically accurate than most cowboy movies. And are that... you sure, Chris? <laughs> well, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Yeah. We are sense, told, though. we are told by everybody <laughs> that this is historically accurate. Uh, one, one thing we should throw out right up front audience is that uh i took japanese for a year but i don't speak japanese and neither does charlie and so all of our sources for this episode come from english language research which was somewhat lacking there were some really in-depth pieces 
But I was kind of surprised that there wasn't a lot of information about the historical accuracy and how it lines up and how uh, Kazuo Koike researched Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, And so there are there are some, I think, gaps in our knowledge for this episode due to, again, the translation barrier. This episode will embody the just a little bit better (laughs) phrase in our mission. Yeah. So. Uh, you may not know what the heck we're talking about. Uh, although I would say this series has, is getting the most word of mouth in the last month or two than it's had in like 20 years. Yeah. This was on the schedule for a while. And now we've got this kind of weird Disney plus synergy of mm-hmm. the Mandalorian, um, being referenced as a lone wolf and cub influenced narrative. Yeah. Yeah. So. Lone Wolf and Cub, you may have heard of it, but you're not familiar with it. It is a manga series that was created by writer Kazuo Koike and artist Goseki Kojima. We may be pronouncing those wrong. That's the best that I remember from my Japanese class, and I think we're just going to stick with it. I did try to look up the official pronunciation, and it was roughly what I just said. (laughs) Roughly. Yeah. There might be some accent marks here and there that I'm missing. There you go. Lone Wolf and Cub was published originally from 1970 to 1976 as a serialized story. The story, which over six years went a bunch of places and went very deep on concepts, histories, and all that, is a story of an assassin who is a disgraced samurai who is named Lone Wolf and Cub Because his son accompanies him throughout his wanderings. Mm -hmm. His three-year-old son. Yeah. Who we meet in a, uh, the most, uh, deadly baby stroller that has ever existed. It's a baby cart in peril, man. That's, uh, (laughs) so I, I know you haven't seen the movies, but I've just recently watched like the first five of the movies. Yeah, that's right. They each have a subtitle that is baby cart something. There's like baby cart in peril, baby cart at the river sticks. It's always about the baby cart. That's very cute. I love it. Um, So we, uh, I think one of us said Epic earlier, the original releases of Lone Wolf and Cub was uh, 28 volumes, 9,000 pages of manga. That's a lot of pages. A fucking lot. Yeah. Yeah. And this came out originally from 1970 to 1976 in a weekly manga magazine. We'll talk about that later. But, you know, basically this was one of the features. I would assume like once a month they would have a Lone Wolf and Cub story in this. These are big, thick stories, too. These Mm -hmm. these probably were anchoring stories for some of these uh these magazines. Yeah. Although I do remember us talking in one of the other episodes, the Goodnight Pun Pun. Some of these magazines are actually books, really, that are published. That's true. Weekly. Like, yeah. Like the thickness is um, much more than we would imagine a manga magazine in America. But it's essentially an anthology collection, a couple of different stories by different creators. Every couple issues, there would be a new Lone Wolf and Cub story. And then each volume that comes out of this is like anywhere from like four to ten of those stories collected together. Yeah, depending and, on relative lengths. Mm-hmm. And so they were collected into those volumes in Japan. And then they were collected here in the United States beginning in the 80s. And they have most recently been collected by Dark Horse Comics in the United States and other English language speaking countries. Uh, I think they started in 2000 and I want to say they finished like three years ago, like publishing all of these. And there's multiple republishings, reprintings of the story. Like there's the single volumes and Mm -hmm. then there's the omnibus volumes, which are maybe uh, three volumes a piece. The, the final omnibus English edition volume 12 that we uh, have a record of was released in April of 2016. There we go. And that's, that's like a, that's a finish. Um, and probably people have taken up Lone Wolf and Cub uh, with various uh, reprintings in the eighties, nineties, early two thousands and late two thousands, uh, excuse me, early two thousand teens. I don't know how you, how do you say that? The that teens? sounds, that sounds fair. 
We're back yeah. at the teens again. But oh, yeah, I mean, Jesus. just to publish this in English, it took roughly 16 years. Um, and, and yeah, like when you look at this, it's like multiple bookshelves in a, in a store. There is yeah. so much work here. And, uh, I'll cop right away. Like, I love this and I still haven't finished it. I'm only a third of the way through, like, probably eight or nine volumes in. So, 3,000 pages. Yeah, only 3,000 pages. <laughs> in. Uh, and I, ha I, I have skipped ahead and read the last volume. I know how it ends and everything. But, uh, essentially these stories are like one and done little missions that the father and son have as they're wandering around feudal Japan. And all leading up to getting their revenge on the guy who disgraced their family. Yeah, it's it's very much like a television series. Yeah. The, the self-contained episodes with a ongoing purpose. So let's uh, break it down. And we'll start by talking about the production and with the writing by Kazuo Koike. So uh, he is known mainly for this. Uh, I, I'd also note the film adaptations, which we'll talk about a little bit later, were also written by Koike, and he has also written other pretty famous manga that's been translated into English, like Crying Freeman, Lady Snowblood, Path of the Assassin, and Samurai Executioner. He passed away just last year at the age of 82. So from a piece in Looper, uh, Micheline Martin writes... The conception of Lone Wolf and Cub was partly inspired by what Kazuo Koike saw as deteriorating family values in Japan. That makes sort of sense, but that also knocked me out. I was like, whoa, that is not what I would have expected at all to be, you know, the instigating feeling. <laughs> Especially when you read this and you're like, whoa, the family values in this book are fucked right, up. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, so the rest of that thought is uh, Koike wanted his story to serve as an example of an invincible bond between father and son. So and this is narrative. sort of your version of Roald Dahl. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Martin says that the narrative reflects this almost supernatural connection between Ito, the uh, disgraced samurai. And how do you say the kid's name? How are you saying it? It's a uh, Daigoro, I believe. Daigoro. Okay. So Kuike has a couple other things under his belt that don't often get talked about in the U.S., but I found a really good obituary that was written about him in the comics journal last year, and it highlighted some things that I had no idea about him. I, I knew about the comics that we mentioned earlier as being his kind of popular English language ones. He has a ton of comics that still haven't been translated into English. Yeah. And if there's anything to take from all this, uh, Kuike might be known for Lone Wolf and Cub in America and it might have taken a long time for it all to get published, but this is not his life's work. Yeah. He's, he's done a lot. Six years is a long time, but it's not a lot compared to all the other work that he has done. So in 1977, he actually started his own educational program for teaching people how to be manga creators. Uh, it's called the Gekiga Sunjuko Institute. And he says this, I do not believe that creating the story from the outset is a good way to begin. I teach my students about how to create a good character. So this gets back to a long storytelling argument that we see manifestations of in our episodes, Charlie, where I think what he's speaking is about plot versus characterization. Yeah. Yeah. You know, coming up with a character and a scenario and then seeing how it goes um, creates a, and here's another quote, a rollicking improvisational serial that seems to be what's going on here yeah yeah uh so there is a criterion collection uh that this is where i most recently watched all of those movies they're all collected together in like a box set which i highly recommend uh but in that collection there are interviews with him and this came out in 2015 and he said that when they first started working on this that the Japanese comic scene at the time was really close knit and that all the people knew each other. And so he approached Goseki Kojima, uh, who at the time was 41 years old when they started working on this and, and had already been working in a bunch of different styles of manga. And he said, look, I, I want to create this new period piece. It's going to be targeted at the young male market. We've talked about this before in our other manga episodes. Yeah. It's usually referred to, I think as a seinen, 
um, the market targeted at young men. And so Koike was in his mid to late thirties and Kojima was 41. These were not older guys, but um, starting middle age guys Mm. working on this comic. Yeah. It's, it's pretty fascinating. Like when you look at this thing, I feel like this is the kind of thing that like a hundred years from now, people are going to zoom out and go like, holy shit, that is like a, a massive, impressive piece of work about the human condition. We will talk about that later on in this episode as a, as a sort of ongoing theme of Lone Wolf and Cub. But I have this vague sense of it being a little bit like Moby Dick mm. in that it is um, a thorough archiving of all of the thoughts of the creator yeah. about the time that they were living in. It's different, of course, because uh, it's set in somewhere between 1600 and 1850. Uh, but it it is long enough and sort of wide reaching enough that it's a portrait of a time by an author and artist mm-hmm. that you could probably pull almost everything about the sense of self at that time from. It feels like it. Yeah. I am going to try to make a habit of going and reading uh, Koike's other works after this, because I realized I've, I've been making my way through Lone Wolf and Cub and it's a lot, uh, but that a lot of this other manga stuff is, sounds interesting and also influential. I know Lady Snowblood is very influential. I have heard stuff about Crying Freeman. That book sounds totally nuts. Well, uh, you know, uh, you just watched, uh, Brotherhood of the Wolf. Yeah. And the American Indian character in that plays Crying Freeman in the movie. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I mean, we'll talk about this in this episode when we get to representation. But, uh, one thing that Koike wasn't so great about is how he handled female characters. Uh, and that is true for sure in Lone Wolf and Cub, but I think it's even worse in Crying Freeman. I, um, I hesitate to enter that pit of snakes. So let's move on and talk about Studio Ship, which was another thing that Koike started. It was a production house for new comics. Uh, they renamed it Koike Showin in the 1990s, and it went out of business in 2016, uh, shortly before he passed away. Well, I, I don't know if they went out of business. They declared bankruptcy in 2016. Yeah. And uh, oddly, none of the stuff, or almost none of the stuff from... 1990 to 2018 uh, that Koike has written made it into the English market. Mm. And I want to say yet, but also, you know, he doesn't seem like a person. I said this already that, you know, Lone Wolf and Cub was not his life's work. The only thing he ever worked on, but he also seems like someone, you know, he uh, started an educational workshop based on Mm. the, the medium he was in. He uh, had his own publishing house that, uh, developed, grew, changed names, and then, you know, tanked or, or, you know, folded in on itself like a really vibrant creative and business life outside of Lone Wolf and Cub. Mm. And yet there's just not a lot of Koike aside from Lone Wolf and Cub in the international mind. Not enough, apparently. And yeah, I, I wonder how much that has to do with how much English language comic publishers think there is a market for his manga translations. I would imagine given the manga boom in the late nineties and early two thousands, that that's why a lot of this stuff was, was repurposed, but again, not enough. It seems I'm always struck by the, um, the idea of how much work it must be just to translate a manga spatially, not even language wise. That's important for us to to note here, actually. So the English language translations of Lone Wolf and Cub are entirely relayed out as well, because most manga reads from right to left and Lone Wolf and Cub's panels have been replaced and then relettered in English so that it reads from left to right as we would read them. Yeah. Do you have any idea if it's a mirror image or just a realignment? I think they're literally taking the panels and cutting them out and rearranging them. Yeah. 
Yeah. I don't think it's mirror image. I don't think they're flipping. They're not just flipping it around. No. It just feels like an intense amount of work. Some production artist did 6,000 pages of that. Yeah. 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 I can just imagine someone who's like in the bar with the cigarette (laughs) saying, oh yeah, I did volumes four through seven, man. Right. It took a really long time. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I bet it does. Um, so Goseki Kojima seems to be a little bit different from Koike in that like he, from what we can tell, was a pretty serious Japanese manga artist. He produced this much work, which is a lot. But uh, he also worked on the two books that I mentioned earlier, Samurai Executioner and Path of the Assassin with Kazuo Koike. But unlike Koike, it's not like he started his own art school and all the, he's He wasn't an entrepreneur as well. Um, he has also passed away, and in 2004, he won the Hall of Fame Eisner Award, which is, you know, like a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yeah. And it does seem that the general sense of Lone Wolf and Cub is that it's both of them. One without the other would not have done the work that is Lone Wolf and Cub. Like, the really cinematic, poetic sort of hanging time... Mm-hmm. that's in Lone Wolf and Cub, the the panel placement. And that's why also it feels like, gosh, I wonder if, I wonder if there's any subtle thing in the original layouts that's lost oh, just yeah. by swapping, you know, the, the right to left to left to right. Or, but anyway. Uh, well, like it, the, the way that I understand, let's, let's pause for a second and like, like get real comics nerdy. Um, okay. The way right. that I understand, like if you are laying out a page correctly, that you are trying to guide the eye through the art to move from one panel to the other, both with the lettering and the way that each shot is framed. Yeah. So like one recommendation is to have like uh, the angle of your quote camera tilting toward the next panel that you want the reader yeah. to go to. So if it's even just like a gravitational, like just a lean yeah. of the panel from right to left to send the reader Mm -hmm. if you don't swap it if you don't mirror the image and you just move it over then it's almost like oh i'm i'm being kept from the next panel by this panel Mm -hmm. yeah yeah or like uh things like the 180 rule might get broken as well you know there's all kinds of just small things that you wouldn't think about but this guy is clearly like a master of the craft he probably was considering as he was laying out each page. Yeah. The so layouts yeah. are striking. I mean, especially mm-hmm. some of those uh, double page ones with a big landscape or a, a very panoramic oh, shot at the yeah. top, you know, that sort of defines like, hey, you're going to look at all of this page all at once, mm-hmm. you know, and then sort of figuring out, oh, am I in this set on the left? Am I this set on the right? Do they connect in lines across the two pages? It's It's all... I could really gush about his artwork for hours. Like, like I was just reading volume one again this morning, getting prepared for this episode and, and like things that he does, uh, especially for the time that are like really well done. Like he, he creates textures with his pens that, uh, give you sort of like depth to these black and white images. It's not, they're not even grayscale. There's no color whatsoever in these. It's just pen and ink. And, uh, it's just pretty remarkable the the different styles and textures and technical abilities that he has in there. And then you'll notice like in storytelling mode, he will switch uh, tools as well in order to sort of emphasize the artwork in different ways to help the story. Like there are some modes where he'll switch from pen to like a thick brush and that mm. will signify like just for one panel, you'll get the thick brush and it's like, oh, that's a, um, I don't know, that's a panel where somebody gets hit by a sword. And so, like, it stands <laughs> out, right? Right. Um, we have a, a really thorough breakdown uh, by Sean O'Rourke of uh, Kojima's sort of principal devices, he calls them. Lone Wolf and Cub is one of those comics that relies heavily on the visual sword fighting as an integral part of its narrative and structure. I can attest to this. Uh, and its artwork is emblematic of the talent necessary to do justice to such a story. Kojima integrates three principal devices during fight sequences to create his visual masterpiece. The first of these effects are frames where Ogami, who is our um, hero, 
Now, do you understand that his name is Lone Wolf and Cub? That that's what they call him? Not that he's Lone Wolf and his son is Cub? Yeah, it it's on the banner, I believe. Okay. You know the banner on the baby cart? Yeah, it's yeah. like an advertisement that he's written right. that says like, the translation I think is roughly like, you know, <laughs> Ogami Ido, you know, assassin for hire, lone wolf and cub. Yeah. And sometimes when he's alone in a scene, the the person will call him lone wolf and cub. It's lone wolf and cub. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Uh Ogami. The first of these effects are frames where Ogami is seen slashing at various foes, but the nuance of the battle is not explicitly revealed. And this is where uh, it's not a detailed um, rendition of a fight or a move. It's really just this like impressionistic burst of energy and violence that, that sort mm-hmm. of leads you into, oh, what the hell just happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And O'Rourke compares this to Kurosawa saying that this is cinematic also in the sense of just motion and uh, uh, implied action instead of showing the audience something literally happening on screen. Right. Rather than seeing like the actual sword edge penetrate flesh, you're seeing like the before and the after and then the after effects. Like one thing that they do a lot, especially in the first volume is like two samurai will stand and be about to fight each other. And, the whole page will just be like them standing there, the quick rush towards each other. You don't really see who hits who. And then the next couple panels will be like static because you're waiting to find out like, Oh, who got cut? And yeah. then the one person falls down. And this, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. This is the kill bill, um, beat that, mm-hmm. uh, people have often talked about at the end of the spoiler alert. For Kill Bill Volume 1, and I guess also Lone Wolf and Cub, eventually. Uh, there's a scene where um, two uh, Beatrix and... Uh, gosh, what is the uh, the other assassin's name? I forgot I can't remember the character's name, um, but it's... Lucy Liu. Lucy Liu, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what her character was called. Okay, it's a so Uma Thurman and type? Lucy Liu are fighting. Mm-hmm. And there is that rush and there's the, a lot of sound effects and a kind of uh, a burst of color and whoosh. And then we stop and we wait while snow falls and we see static shots of them waiting. And then somebody collapses or, um, you know, we, we cut to Lucy Liu's face and we see her wound. Mm -hmm. Like I did not know it at the time, but after reading Lone Wolf and Cub and reading O'Rourke's description, it's obvious like, oh yeah. That is totally a lone wolf and cub style cinema. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like Kojima almost created his own language for this kind of storytelling. Um, There's a, so this O'Rourke piece, I I should mention, it's like 11 articles. It's really long. And O'Rourke seems to be the person who has done the most work looking into like what this series is all about. Is it Dr. O'Rourke? Is this the dissertation? I don't think so because it was written for Pop Matters. I don't know that Pop Matters <laughs> is giving out doctorates yet, but they might be. Okay. Uh, so O'Rourke, he said he's got three devices that uh, he wants to talk about. So the next layer, uh, O'Rourke says, used by Kojima, involves inviting the reader to predict what is going to occur in the fight sequence by relying on visual cues. And I think you started talking about this a little bit, like these static shots that sort of set the scene Mm -hmm. and then let you imagine, Oh, I'm about to see what's going to happen. But then you don't see it. It's implied by the first device. Um, So there are visual cues that bring the reader into the story uh, closely paralleled with, and then here's where it gets exciting, Chris choreographed fight sequences of professional wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, the minute O'Rourke printed this out, I was like, Oh yeah, totally. I get, I get what he's saying. Like it's, it's almost it's, like uh, when it's someone kayfabe. taps their elbow, right. Mm-hmm. And says, this is what's going to, what's going to hit somebody. Yeah. And yeah. then you can, uh, you can perform it and it becomes something more because the audience has been given a cue to, this is what you're going to see. Mm hmm. There's a kind of pageantry to the way that the fights are shown in the comic 
I don't know that that is historically true of the way samurai fought each other, right? They probably weren't signaling to each other what attack move they were going to use. <laughs> but in terms of the storytelling, that is part of the practice. Yeah, they damn well do now, right? This is like, mm. I, I remember uh, reading that um, FBI agents who were listening to mafia, uh, you know, subjects of investigations. Mm-hmm discovered that they began changing the way they spoke until they sounded like Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci after the <laughs> movies came out. Wow. Where they did not before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so O'Rourke sums this up by saying, um, when viewers or readers have properly decoded the tropes and characteristics of often repetitive fights, it strengthens the viewer's sense of involvement and their knowledge of techniques being employed. So this is like, by creating a language or defining a language and then asking the reader to get into it over the course of many, many, um, you know, episodes of a serial, mm. this is part of the investment in the story as much as the character or yeah. the long arc mythology is. I just read a, a piece of advice on writing recently that I, I've probably said this before because I reread this piece of advice, but it was that um, beginnings to stories should teach the reader the language that the story is going to be told in. So it should set up your expectations of how the rest of the story is going to play out and how you should, uh, you know, how you should expect to learn how to follow the yeah. narrator. What you'll be asked to pay attention to mm-hmm. and what it, you'll be asked to fill in. And I think they do it very well here. The first volume whether they did it intentionally or not, sets you up for another 27 volumes of storytelling. Although O'Rourke points out that the final layer of Kojima's visual storytelling only shows up in the last couple volumes of the series. Um, and he, he describes this as these just incredibly long, complex fights that are broken down panel by panel by panel. Like, I think the last fight in the entire series is like, like an entire volume of the book or well, something 178 crazy like that. 178 pages is yeah. what someone marked it down as, like a fight between two swordsmen. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's intense. Um, you were just talking about how you just read Next Wave in one of our mini episodes. Yeah. And I always think about uh, the way that Next Wave experiments with panel-to-panel storytelling especially in the in Next Wave's last issue, which is all double-page spreads. And yeah. that's sort of the opposite of this, right? Like, they're going big on every single page. So it's really just a 22-panel comic rather than a 22-page comic. Yeah. But if that was the first one that you read or if they used that in the first comic, yeah, it would be incredibly hard to get into. And you'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm being rejected by this story because this is just crazy from, you know, from yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And let's never forget, this was episodic. Mm -hmm. They weren't writing volumes. They were writing um, a serial that was one episode at a time. And so they had to consider, you know, a long time between each of these episodes. And even if they didn't know they were going to go on for a long time, I bet you they hoped that their job would continue. Right? Yeah. Well, here's what I... There's there's no evidence in the English research from what I saw, but here's what I imagine happened. If you look at the the dates and how they all line up, it seems that Lone Wolf and Cub became very popular before it finished in weekly manga action. Yeah. So I think that there was a certain point where they were like, oh, we can go as long as we want and we can get experimental. And so that probably explains why the end plays out like that. Like, I'm pretty sure... Some of the movies were in production before the manga finished. Uh, before the story was all told. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So let's let's lean into that. So Weekly Manga Action was the name of the serial that these stories came out in. And as we said before, it was a seinen manga magazine directed at young men. It started in 1967. Uh, it's still being published today. And uh, originally it was a weekly magazine. It has since switched to being a bi-monthly magazine as of 2003. As of 2010, okay, this is the most recent numbers, its circulation was 200,000 copies per issue, which is like 
astronomically higher yeah. than most American superhero comics. So, Chris, let me get your subjective opinion. Do you feel like this is a a, a different way of doing comics that could be better for creators that we uh, quote unquote ought to take on here in America? Or do mm -hmm. you think that this is a different way that you wouldn't uh, wouldn't replace our system with? There's a lot to unpack there, Charlie. Yes. Um, so I will take a, I'll take a detour, but guide me back when it starts getting a little too esoteric. All right. So, uh, one, no, I do not think, uh, that the American system should be replaced with the Japanese system. The, the research that I've read, and uh, I've, I've mentioned this book before that I, I've read as well, that's about like the practice of being a mangaka. Yeah. Uh, everything that I've read is that it's uh, just as predatory <laughs> as the American <laughs> system, and that the creators are all overworked and underpaid, uh, and that they're basically told, like, well, you're doing this for the prestige of it, or you're doing this because gotcha. like, then it will uh, showcase your stuff so that you can go on and do another job that'll pay better. Right. Um, so a lot of the people who are in that career in Japan are depressed and exhausted <laughs> from, from so, what I've heard. Yeah. So despite the idea that, Oh, if you put all of the DC superhero comics into a, a serial, yeah. That had a 200,000 circulation number. Yeah. Right. Rather solve... than publish like an issue of Green Arrow and an issue of, I don't know, Hawkman, you have one thick digest that has all those stories in it. Yeah. I, the other. So, yeah, I don't think it would change the, the practices behind the scenes. Right. Or make. Sorry. It would change them. It just wouldn't make them better. Um, and And I also think that. English language audiences do not gravitate towards anthology formats the same uh -huh. way that other audiences do. So yeah. anthologies typically do very poorly in the American market. So you're, so what I'm hearing you say, Chris, is that you're happy for creators to only sell seven, 5,000. <laughs> no, I'm not. Both. What I'm saying is both systems are fundamentally broken. Charlie. <laughs> And that is me bringing you back. Okay. Yeah. So weekly manga action, um, uh, 200,000 is its circulation as of 2010. Um, and that's bi-monthly. Right. They're so that, that means that they're selling 400,000 per month. Yes. Or, which is even more than. Or they're selling 200,000 every other month. You can never oh, know with bi-monthly. So, that's true. I do know, however, <laughs> because I wrote the note. There are two issues a month. <laughs> two issues a month. I, yeah. I mean, bi-monthly is one of those, like, are you fucking kidding me? Don't use that word. You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, Fudabasha is the company that publishes weekly manga action, which I guess is now bi-monthly manga action. And they're based in Tokyo. <laughs> I think it's just called manga action. Now. <laughs> that would be hilarious. Bi-monthly. <laughs> I'm really, I'm having a great time with this because <laughs> manga, manga is amazing as a, as a cultural, um, I, I, what, what would you even call it as a, as an assumption, as a cultural assumption, like mm -hmm. this is how these stories work in the comic industry in Japan. And it's amazing to think about how it developed a certain way. It is its own thing. Now it's so different from how we understand being a comics consumer. Yeah. Uh, in America. And it's, it's not that I think one is better than the other, or I'm so happy it exists. It's just, it makes me feel kind of goofy and light to have such a different system presented. I, I think if you're taking like the really long view, the thing I love about manga and especially something like Lone Wolf and Cub is, uh, the comics medium itself, if you're being generous is only like 150 years old. Uh, yeah. and the idea that it grew so quickly and it spread like fire around the planet and that different cultures adapted the medium and figured out ways to tell their own stories in it is, is fascinating. Yeah. And that it is because of it being a business that these systems arose mm -hmm. as opposed to just, you know, people have been drawing and trying to tell stories. Yes. You know, since you started drawing, but you know, it's capitalism 
created these such different, not opposed, but different uh, systems. Okay. Yeah, very true. So this is a good point for us to switch gears and talk about the American exactly, publishers. Yeah. I want to I want to make sure that we always foreground mm. the original series was a weekly or every other week series for six years, nineteen seventy to nineteen seventy six, and then it wasn't until at least ten years later that. Uh, an American company started trying to bring it out here. Yeah. So first comics is the comic book publisher that first was making these translations. And, uh, I don't know, you know, if, if you're just a relatively recent comic book reader, you're probably not familiar with first comics, but this was one of the, uh, great, I question mark, independent comics publishers of the 80s and 90s a a lot of the stuff that i remember as being like the the boom of like creator-owned independent books came out of this so you have a list of things here and only mm. one of them is something i'm familiar with and that's just because we've done this show oh american flag yeah american flag howard chaykin's american flag uh was one of those books Grimjack, Nexus, Badger, Dreadstar, and John Sable. These are the books that, like, I grew up and it was like, ooh, like, can I grab an issue of that? Like, will they sell that to me? Right. You know, because it seemed like there was some, there, something dirty about grabbing one of these off the shelf when I was so a kid. These were in the back of the comic book store? They weren't. They were, they were shelved <laughs> with everything right else. <laughs> and a lot of these books are qualify as, like, superhero books, but there was just something about them. They had a very different tone and approach. Okay. Uh, Badger in particular. I remember reading Badger when I was probably like 10 years old and being like, what is this? <laughs> um, but first we're based out of Evanston, Illinois. And they started in 1983 and almost immediately they got into it with Marvel. <laughs> right. So here, here is a summary. And I think that we're... We're letting you, the listener, know that this happened. I certainly don't have an opinion about what's true and what's um, propaganda I in do. this story. And then <laughs> Chris has an opinion, and I'm going to try and keep him from getting too deep into it. Uh-huh. In 1984, First Comics sued Marvel Comics, claiming that Marvel was flooding the market with new titles in 1983 specifically to knock out First. Like they said... Hey, there's an independent publisher. Let's drown them. Let's make sure we have titles that are fulfilling the role that you just mentioned, Chris. That's sort of, oh, can I get these? Yeah, let me let me pause for a second and explain what this means in terms of the direct market, okay? So um, I don't know if Diamond were the exclusive publisher in the 80s, but you pretty much have like one distributor for the entire direct market of comic books in America. And your average comic book retailer opens up their catalog every month and they say, these are the books that I'm going to order and I'll put on my shelves when they arrive. I only have so much money. I can only order so many books. I have to choose the books that I know my customers are going to buy. And so when Marvel does something like this, they are essentially creating so many options that uh, it it restricts the amount of independent books that a retailer right. can purchase from a company like first. This is happening right now in 2020 yeah. all over this is again. Why people talk about pre-orders mm-hmm. and they make it so clear. Like, listen, if you like this um, series that we're doing, or if you like this creator support them by pre-ordering so that the comic book store knows, Hey, I can yeah. put this on the shelf. Um, I believe in December of 2019, Some of our listeners may be able to correct me on this, but my understanding is that Marvel put out over a hundred different titles uh, in the month of December, which significantly narrowed the range of which retailers were able to order from independent publishers. Now, the other part of First Comics sort of legal um, attacks, they sued the printer World Color Press um, uh, suing it for anti-competitive activities, saying that they undercharge Marvel and that they overcharge first and independent presses. I have no doubt that Marvel paid less per unit than first did. Yeah, I mean, just like basic 
printing, like how that business works is the more you order, the less you pay per unit. Yeah. So, but I don't, first was suing to say this is uh, <clears throat> unreasonable. The differences yeah. in these prices. Yeah, I I think that these bits are important for us to note because it sets the tone for what the market was like when Lone Wolf and Cub was hitting the stands and what it had to compete with. Yeah. Uh, but also that like the people that were interested in translating this and bringing it to the American market uh, were you know really like kind of having a like David versus Goliath moment yes. while this was going on. And Marvel was not trying to bring out Lone Wolf and Cub. No. So First Comics existed from 1983 to 1991. It spent 84 to 88 uh, in this lawsuit or in these lawsuits. And it was in 1986 that it first started publishing um, Lone Wolf and Cub in some kind of American translation. Yeah. I have not seen any of these first comics. I don't know how they compare to the Dark Horse stuff that I have seen. I mean, the Dark Horse stuff is clearly redesigned for a book market. So yeah. that when you go to Barnes and Noble, you'd be like, ooh, this looks very nice. Um, they were more like comics. The, yeah. The Lone I mean, it says, that, it says first comics did this as single issues. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So we should mention that one of the reasons why this got translated into English is Frank Miller's fandom of Lone Wolf and Cub. Um, he's made no secret of it. He has drawn the cover art for many of these editions. Um, he's a huge fan. It's influenced his work. And he wrote the introductions for several of the volumes. Yeah. Um, Ronan. Uh, is Ronan the 47 Ronan story? Uh, no, Ronan's, I, I, I actually told you, I, I just started reading Ronan last month cause I, I'd never read it before it. I thought it might be that as well, but it's not, it's actually like a sci-fi story about, oh, okay. uh, a Ronan from historical Japan getting brought to the future and put in the body of a <laughs> okay. cyborg. Yeah. I'm not going to stop the podcast and now look up, but I, I do have a sense that Miller has done multiple stories that pull on samurai ronin mm -hmm. kurosawa like uh stories yeah i mean but, you can even see the influence of lone wolf and cub in something like dark knight returns yeah actually okay so first comics um started bringing out lone wolf and cub in 86 did not get to the end of the series they folded in 1992 and that ended their attempt to publish lone wolf and cub so if you were a uh English reading fan of Lone Wolf and Cub at some point in the nineties, your supply was cut off between 92 and like early two thousands. You had to go digging through, through back issue bins to find anything of this. And you'd be lucky if you found them. Um, yeah. And that's one of many reasons why I didn't read this until I was older. Cause <laughs> my prime, you know, comic buying time in stores, like it just wasn't around. I would heard of it. I'd seen it, but I, never bought it before um so dark horse comes along they they had already been around well for first was publishing it but they started publishing these in the early 2000s we've mentioned before they've done all 28 volumes uh we've mentioned dark horse a couple times in other episodes it feels like dark horse is in a lot of stuff we've been talking about most notably we did a hellboy episode I'm trying to remember if there's anything else but um dark horse is an american comic book publisher that was started in 1986 and it was started by a guy named Mike Richardson here in Portland, uh, just in the suburb of Milwaukee, just outside of Portland. Uh, they are known. You're probably familiar with them because of Hellboy, the mask, Sin City. They put out a lot of different licensed material. They had the star Wars license for a long time and the Buffy license. They, I think the current big ones for them are like alien and predator. Yeah, and Alien, the Dark Horse Alien comics are the ones that I've read, and we talked a little bit about that, because I find them very compelling without really sort of uh, investing in them as a comic book series. Yeah, 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 yeah. I enjoy a lot of the Alien stuff that they do. Um, they started a manga imprint that translated manga into English. Lone Wolf and Cub is not the only manga that they do. They, they, they put out quite a bit of manga. And we should point out, we mentioned in those what they're known for, Hellboy, Mask, and Sin City, which is the Frank Miller series. Mm -hmm. So Frank Miller, who wrote introductions to Lone Wolf and Cub's first English printing, 
is part of the Dark Horse community. And then Dark Horse in 2000 starts printing Lone Wolf and Cub. And they released all of the issues over two years. And I'm really curious about how the numbers work for that. Oh, you know what? So earlier I said they finished in 2016. I apologize. I guess what I meant was the Omnibus editions finished in yeah, 2016. Yeah, that was the second printing, like the, okay. you know, putting all the volumes together from 2013 to 2016. But the Digest volumes came out over a course of two years. Yeah. And as I mentioned, Frank Miller did some covers, but they also got other people like Matt Wagner and Bill Sienkiewicz to do cover work for them. Um, so there's there's like these really eye grabbing covers to the Lone Wolf and Cub digest. Yeah, they're, they're beautiful. Yeah, uh, and uh, they're they're uh, actually colored in as well. And then you know you get like, well, the first volume is almost ten stories, I think. Yeah, it's it's a lot, and it's really contemplative too. It's um, I, I remember reading some reviews of it after I finished it, and some people were like. This was way too slow for me. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. This is the too old to die young of comics. Oh my right? God. <laughs> like it, it, it has, because it's 50 years old, it has, and, uh, from a foreign country, it has a very different dialect to how it tells yeah. comic stories. But yeah, I, it's slow for a lot of people. A different sense of strategy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Japan Times, um, did a, I guess they reviewed Dark Horse reprinting it? Yeah, I think, I think there was just sort of a, a general reassessment of the series yeah. after uh, Kojima died. So here's a really nice paragraph from Japan Times to kind of cement all the stuff we've talked about in terms of production. By turns violent, tender, erotic, and philosophical, Kazuo Koike's well researched story joins with Goseki Kojima's visceral artwork to evoke the government, government bureaucracy. <laughs> that's kind of, that's not what I it's expected. It's a mouthful. <laughs> government bureaucracy, Buddhism, Yakuza, military strategy, Bushido, and martial arts of the times. Whoa. So there's a note here. Uh, I'm sorry. It completely contradicts what I said earlier. You mentioned that you thought that they were laid out in mirror opposite. Uh, this Japan Times says... That the Western style is in mirror opposite of the Japanese original. So I think I'm wrong. Well, I, thought, I thought they were manually putting the panels in order. Do you order. think, I mean, just because Japan Times is saying mirror opposite. I think the reason I thought that is that the um, the the borders for the panels looked uh -huh. digital okay. compared to his uh, his art style. Like they, they're very precise borders. And so it looked to me like. Somebody went in, threw a new border on the panel, cut it out, and then manually relayed out a page in, like, I don't know, Illustrator or InDesign. Okay. But I I could be wrong. Uh, listeners, if you know what the answer to that is, let us know. Yeah, please. Uh, supercontextpodcast at gmail.com. All right. Well, on that uh, sort of hanging in time note, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll do more numbers. Charlie, much like uh, Daigoro and Ogami Ito, you and I are slowly on the path to hell. We are walking the demon's way. To our inevitable demise. Yeah, it's to the retirement of Super Context, which is coming up in May of 2020. Yeah. There's a baby cart, and I'm in it, and you're pushing it. Okay, so I get to kill people, and you're just going to watch for a little while? Daigoro kills people, too. Occasionally, he pushes late, a button here. Late there. in the game, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but while we're on our way down this path of the demon, uh, we are still an active Patreon campaign because Super Context is supported by our listeners through Patreon. This community, I, I feel so um, lacking in words when I start really thinking about what the Patreon community has done for us, what's happened to the, the podcast once we started really connecting with the listeners and what we've been able to do because of the support that they've provided. I mean, I would say we've made lifelong friends through doing this show, not just between you and I, we were already lifelong friends yeah. but with listeners of the show as well. Uh, but outside of that, the support for this show lets us do really like, kind of material, practical things like pay our hosting fees or cover the expenses for the stuff that we're researching, uh, maintaining the recording setup, 
making sure that we've got good production, yeah. all of that stuff. And when we hit May and we cease production of regular episodes, the Patreon will continue. And as long as we have patrons, we'll be able to make the archive of the show free to the public and the bonus content available to our Patreon community. Yeah. Uh, we have a bunch of things coming up on the show, but I want to let you know that when you're a patron of Super Context, you're not just supporting us. You're getting something back. Uh, there are many rewards that are available if you check out patreon.com slash supercontext. These include things like outtakes of us, blooper reels, bi-weekly bonus mini episodes, and every month we do a Super King Context episode. It's an entire episode of Super Context, normal length, that are about adaptations of Stephen King's work. This month we are doing the calendar, Silver Bullet. And uh, we are also on we're doing own... the movie based on the calendar. Yeah, we're we're <laughs> on our own path of the demon when it comes to Stephen King adaptations because at the end of this is yeah. the cocaine fueled nightmare of Maximum Overdrive. Yeah, if there's any hell on earth, it's got to be Maximum Overdrive. Before we go back to Lone Wolf and Cub to see where they're at, we have one last Patreon thing that we need to take care of, and that is the thank you to all our patrons who want one. Let me start with our new patrons, like a gaggle of what's the collective noun for patrons. They all yeah. showed up. I think Thank uh, you. It's, it's like ferrets. It's a business of patrons. I love it. A business of patrons. Thank you so much to Beth Gilmore, Brandon Daniels, Jim Taylor, and John Pheasant for joining the community. Thank you also to Alex Laird, Alice Florence, Ambrose Allen, Amit Doshi, Andy Riggs, B.B. Schwells, Bennett Callahan, Beth Barnett, Billy Whitehouse, and Bing Bong Man. Thank you to Brian Chovenich, Caroline Zoids, Chris Marlton, Cliff Landis, Coco, Dave Jordan, Dave Wachter, Eilish Phillips, Elijah Tilstra, Evan Mapstone, Fred Rasco, Gregory C. Giordano, Ira James Udiskin, Jason Puckett, Jess Staten, Joseph Aleo, Juan Patton, Hunta Slash Cult, Calvin Ellis, Carmela Padovich, Kate Sharon, and Kevin Wetter. Thank you also to Christian Hirvola, Lee Fowler, Lokesh Dakar, Luigi Oswego, Melinda Hale, Miriam Meany, Misha Moon, Nathan Weatherford, Nick Sage, Patrick Malka, Pete Bowe, Philip, R.M. Rhodes, and the podcast Rain It In, Matt and Rachel. And thank you to Rob Sloan, Robert Negoesco, Roman Marichik, Romantic Placebo, Ron Bilodeau, Ross Llewellyn, Ryan O'Neill, Sari Nichols, Seth Friedman, Simon Workman, Tara Meshack, Thomas Tremberger, Veal Height, and Whitney Buchanan. Impressive finish. If you want to join this group and listen to us talk about how a calendar got turned into a movie, you can go to patreon.com slash supercontext. And we're back. Chris, what have you got for us when it comes to how this sold? Well, we already mentioned that the current periodical of uh, manga action is selling something like 200,000 copies an issue, which gives us a sense of generally like how many readers are in the Japanese market for something like this. Now, uh, this is insane. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the copies in the collected form in Japanese have sold more than 8 million units in Japan. Nice. That's that goes to show you just how significant uh the market was and how much it's dwindled, but in both senses those numbers are way higher than what American periodical comics usually sell. And then we have a very complicated set of numbers that we have to pull apart. Yeah. It I used to top the trade paperback sales list. And this is where I finally understand completely what you have told me over and over again, Chris. The books, book market, is separate from the numbers that you can get from Diamond. Yeah. yeah. So when they say uh, Lone Wolf and Cub sold 14,000-ish units at the end of its run of collected volumes, that doesn't take into account anything that was bought in a Barnes and Noble, off of Amazon, mm -hmm. you know, in uh, in the uh, airport convenience store. 
Yeah, or uh, any digital sales after digital became, uh, you know, a platform for something like this. But uh, we should also note that the direct market numbers don't include sell-through numbers. Those are the numbers of what stores purchased and brought into their shops. We don't know that they actually sold all those copies. Uh, okay. So it is obviously a huge seller in Japan and it is anecdotally a huge seller, but also when you look at the numbers for collected runs, they look like any collected edition yeah. these days. It's yeah. pretty average, but then when you consider there's 28 volumes out there, that's significant. And that's one of the reasons why it topped the trade paperback sales list. So remember, Dark Horse put this out over the period of two years. So I think during those two years, you'd look at like the top 10 uh, trade paperbacks that came out those years and like eight of them would be Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah. Cause they were cheap. And mm -hmm. if you were into them, you were into them. Yeah, exactly. It had a dedicated audience. So now is the point where we should talk about why is this such a big deal? Like, why is everybody talking about Lone Wolf and Cub? Why are, you know, it seems to be hugely influential. Well, Outside of the millions of people who read it in Japan and the hundreds of thousands of people who read it in English, uh, there have also been a lot of adaptations of this. So there were, I mentioned the films earlier, I think there's six, maybe seven Japanese language films, four plays, and then there was a television series as well. The plays are really amazing to me. I would love to see what that looks like. I want to I want to see the baby cart in those plays. <laughs> so in the 70s, while it was still being first printed, they started releasing movies. Uh, Toho Company, which um, we've talked about before because of Kurosawa and who also uh, it, it, who are also the home of Godzilla movies. Mm -hmm. They started doing a series based on um, the comics with a single actor as the uh, titular lone wolf and uh those came over here as a re-edited version of the first two films called shogun assassin which people seem to know about and then oh here's a nice little bit of trivia the guy who played ogami ito in lone wolf and cub is the older brother of the guy who played zaruichi shintaro katsu um and uh People make a lot, a big deal out of how um, uh, Tomisa, Tomisaburo Wakayama is not thin. <laughs> yeah, Isn't, it's I, weird. <laughs> I noticed that in the in the um, research, and I have to say, when I was watching it myself, I was like, "Wow, I really like how they didn't place any emphasis on him getting like super toned and buff." for like a modern day appeal. Yeah, there's no Henry Cavill being Superman. No, here. like this is just a guy and he's kind of a chonky guy. Um, but it works in the context of these movies. Uh, yeah, the so <laughs> the Lone Wolf and Cub movies, something else that I learned when I was watching them recently is it wasn't like they put out one and then they waited a year to see how it did and then they put out another one. These were almost like a TV series in terms of production production schedule like they cranked out six of them i think in like two or three years yeah so it was so popular they just no one thought for a moment like oh we shouldn't do this they right. just made the movies mm -hmm. now there have also been sequels to the comics as well including uh work that koike himself wrote so uh there's both lone wolf and cub 2100 i have not read that but my understanding is that is like a cyberpunk future yeah. version of the story now let me stop you here for just a moment mm -hmm. this is where i really want to say if you are a listener who wants to read this 28 mm -hmm. volume epic and doesn't want to know the inevitable conclusion we're going to talk a little bit about that because now we're talking about sequels yeah so there is also a series called shin lone wolf and cub translated to new lone wolf and cub in english and Koike started working on this somewhere around 2002 and it has a different artist because Kojima passed away. Uh, but basically the idea was spoilers. 
uh, the series ends with the father dying in combat versus his mortal enemy. And the writer was like, I want to know what happens to Daigoro, this three-year-old who's like just witnessed all this brutal mayhem <laughs> and his yeah. father died. And so new Lone Wolf and Cub is about that. It picks up right where the the first 28 volumes leave off. Essentially like a new samurai. I've read like the first volume. A new samurai literally shows up and he's like, whoa, that was a crazy fight. You want to follow me along now, kid? And <laughs> so it's kind that of like a, that. A little bit on the nose. A little. Cool. And and also I like that um, Koike says, around the same time that I was wondering what happened to Daigoro, uh, I was approached to write a new story. <laughs> oh, com- that's Shukan convenient. Post asked me to write a sequel. And I was like, oh, you know, I was just thinking about that, <laughs> which I find hard to believe, but that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so those are available as well. I don't know how many volumes there are of new Lone Wolf and Cub, but uh, it's interesting. It's not the same because the arts are different, but yeah. um, it's it's pretty interesting to take a look at if you're a big fan of this stuff. I mean, it's basically a remix, isn't it? It's like it's a 30 years later. What does the writer think? Yeah. And, uh, of you know, and how do they process the same story again with a different set of assumptions? Yeah. And again, I haven't read all of it, but I think it like my question would be like, how fucked up is Daigoro when he grows up? Right. Like oh, this completely. kid's got to be a total mess. And he's probably as fucked up as his dad is. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. His dad is super fucked. Up. <laughs> and uh, I don't think the sequel answers that. I think it's just like he, now he's four instead of three, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Now, here's a, a, a funny little story to me, because Aronofsky, it turns out, has this this Frank Miller connection or this Frank mm. Miller minor obsession. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aronofsky, who is the director who did Pie and Requiem for a Dream and most recently did Mother, uh, he mm. was trying to make Lone Wolf and Cub pretty much at the same time that Dark Horse was publishing the first round of uh, reissues. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um he also wanted to do a Batman Year One and Ronin, which is, of course, the Frank Miller thing. Uh, in 2009, he finally reported publicly that it's not going to happen. And he said that it was rights complications. So this is interesting to me. The, I, the thought that yeah. somebody wanted to make a movie version, and I have no doubt that Dark Horse would be like, oh, cool, do it. But... There must be some holdover from the Japanese movies and who owned rights. Yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is. All I know from behind the scenes is that Dark Horse is very involved in their media properties. But I can't imagine that uh, the the Japanese company that originally created this and probably holds the rights would give would cede media rights to them as well because right, if someone started making a new movie series it would almost be like well now they're making it and, yeah. and we're out yeah although in 2017 um hollywood reporter said that paramount was going to produce a new lone wolf and cub with justin lynn directing yeah uh, of fast and furious my and guy also, andrew kevin walker of all people the guy who wrote seven um attached to the project to write it now, I haven't heard anything else about that. <laughs> that is a... So, I don't think that's happening. Yeah. Well, there there is still some rumor uh, going around that it's in pre-production. But as we know, they just announced the week that we're recording this, Justin Lin's new movie is Fast and the Furious 9. So, he probably doesn't have time. Hey, do you know what that movie's company. about, Chris? I do. It's about how John family. Cena is Vin Diesel's brother. <laughs> <laughs> it's about family. I can't wait to go see it. And more family. <laughs> And how uh, your family. Sorry. If see, you family... clearly haven't seen any of those movies because in those movies, they don't say family. They say me familia. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. I have seen those movies and that's not the only thing they say. <laughs> they also say have a Corona. Sometimes they also say we have to understand why he's doing it. He's got to have a reason. And they also say hit the NOS. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. Let us move on, because I think the thing to think about um, is that Lone Wolf and Cub has been made into multiple movies in America without the name. Right. And without the story and without the characters. It it is something that you will recognize when you read the original because it has been 
made and processed a lot by um, some very popular media. I mentioned Kill Bill earlier. Uh, it, it, Tarantino was explicit. I use sword work and samurai moves from Lone Wolf and Cub. Uh, he even has a reference to Shogun Assassin in the second Kill Bill to make it clear. I mentioned Road to Perdition earlier, uh, written by Max Allen Collins and illustrated by Richard Piers Rayner. And uh, I did not know until after I'd seen it that it is Lone Wolf and Cub. Right. Almost yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, but with Tom Hanks as the samurai. Yeah. So a hitman takes his son along when he goes to revenge himself upon a mob boss who betrayed him and murders his family. Um, and even like the recognizing that the end, a dead dad and a living son, you know, with the enemy vanquished, that's mm -hmm. the lone wolf and cub reference also within the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's just tons of examples, like doing the research on this, a lot of movies that I hadn't even thought of in my head as being lone wolf and cub, like, are cited here for instance the road the cormac mccarthy book slash adaptation into the movie yeah. oh yeah of course that's a lone wolf and cub <laughs> at, now do you, you know think, of reference. course that's a, a reference or do you think that that's just sort of impossible to avoid because like did cormac mccarthy read lone wolf and cub and mm. then try and you know render that or is that just like that's how much that's lone a, wolf and cub is around yeah that's a good question it's been a while since I read that book and it's super depressing, but in the film, he does push him around in a grocery cart. Um, mm, I don't know. Yeah. We'll okay. have to ask Cormac McCarthy the next time he's on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to talk to him soon. We, we have <laughs> coffee together every hundred years. Uh, Samurai Jack is also uh, pointed out as being influenced by this. Uh, we mentioned the Mandalorian earlier and how lots of people are excited about baby Yoda and that, Baby Yoda is essentially the new Daigoro. Um, and Chris, let's hmm. remember, that's not a baby Yoda. That is a child of the same species as Yoda. I'm on board with you. I, I think it's <laughs> potentially offensive to call it baby Yoda. But I just know. find it delightful that that's a, a, that's a parsing of meaning that people have to do these days. Mm -hmm. um, the other movie that I think seems to be influenced by this, but I could be wrong, is Leon the Professional. Yeah, and you know what? That brings up the sort of – that makes it even more explicit than the, the road thing. It is so primal, so sort of immediate, the idea of a parent who loses one of – you know, loses the other uh, parent and has to protect the kid in a violent world with violent action. Like, it is a story that can – call to mind a lot of different stories mm. you know yeah that's true May yeah so maybe some of this stuff is influenced maybe it's not but we do know for instance that people like tarantino and miller have have stated this is an influence on me now all of the research i was like yeah okay everybody loves this and then i hit this piece by hans rollman at pop matters and he kind of hit the brakes on that the same publication that printed 11 or published <laughs> yeah. an 11 part essay on how important mm -hmm. Lone Wolf and Cub is. So Rollman wrote this a uh, couple years after O'Rourke's pieces and said, for all of its fame and awards, Lone Wolf and Cub is not perfect. The battle scenes, they're intricately orchestrated and illustrated, but they grow tiresome after a point. As soon as one realizes that Ito will defeat all challengers handily, no matter how many there are or how talented the battles become far less interesting. This is an interesting point that I think about when I'm reading or watching Lone Wolf and Cub and still enjoy. Well, this is where I realized this is Jack Reacher. Oh, yeah. Yes, this totally. is a, an alpha hero or an unbeatable hero. So mm -hmm. when we did our Jack Reacher episode, we talked about how Lee Child made a decision. The author made a decision to write a hero who always won. There would not be the, uh, you know, small loss or the, the initial loss to then um, recover and triumph over. Yeah, this there's no be, stakes. Yeah, except somehow there is because one does stay connected to the story 
despite yeah. the fact that Lone Wolf and Cub uh, consistently does extraordinary superhuman things, makes plans that involve yeah. things like I will be thrown in jail and beaten until I am almost dead, and then I will kill everyone. Like yeah. that's the plan. Yeah. And yeah. so they're it, absurd, but but there's some. It's the cooking thing again for me. I there's something about the process of watching it that is really enjoyable for me. Yeah, I I feel like and you know, I haven't really thought this through, but Rollman's comment or his problem is almost like someone saying um I I'm kind of tired of painting because people keep painting people. You know, <laughs> like I, I'm kind of done with portraiture yeah. because it's always a rendition of a person. It's like, yes, yeah. absolutely. If you have decided that you need a particular thing, like if Rollman says, I need to know that my hero might die, then yeah, he's not going to get it out of Lone Wolf and Cub yeah. until the end. But the story is not, oh, will he succeed? Right. It's more like, why is he succeeding? How did it happen? What is the... What is the obstacle that he is able to overcome? Well, I also think like the story is how is his success making him dysfunctional, both as a parent and as like a, a human being? Yeah. Also, how is it making him functional? I mean, this this is yeah, a that story too. where the guy meets the Buddha on the road and kills him. Yeah. You yeah. Know, like this is there. There is so much about how one can become a fully realized person in in western and eastern philosophies and all that that it it is something much more than just oh will our hero make it over this pit of snakes kind <laughs> right. of stuff yeah yeah very much so that um that's not what this is about and yeah, so I wouldn't recommend that. Like, if that's what you're looking for and you haven't read this before, you will be disappointed like Rollman was. Like, 27 volumes. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty rare. That Every there's... episode of this television show is the same. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, until the very last episode. Um, but they're all bizarrely interesting in their own ways. Like, the... The ways, one of the things I'm fascinated by is the ways in which Koike comes up with different antagonists and, and tries to make them seem like they're going to be the ones that are going to defeat Ito this time. You know, like, uh, um, yeah. there's one, they did this in the movie and in the manga. It's in the first volume, but it's like, um, this, this troop of female assassins who are all in disguise. Oh, yeah. The eight gates that, yeah, uh, they practice their, um, moves naked because that's important. Yes, they do in the film as well. They do. Yeah. Uh, and so like stuff like that, it's like, or, or he'll introduce these guys and he'll be like, these are the new antagonists this time. This is who he has to assassinate this week. And these guys, these are the weapons they use. And it's like, one of them's a chain with like a claw hand. And the other one is, <laughs> you know, like, like each guy has these incredibly exotic weapons and they all fall to him as well, you know? Yeah. Because it's not important about can he do it. Mm -hmm. It's important how and why. And it's also important that Daigoro is covered in as much blood as possible at the end of each battle. Or like trapped basically, in a cave and yeah. has to accept that, you know, listen, just be cool. You'll die if I don't come back Holy and accept cow. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is the other like weird perversion of reading Lone Wolf and Cub is just being like, man, like when this kid grows up and he looks back, he's going to be like, oh man, like I have a lot of reasons to be fucked up. Like <laughs> well, no, don't <laughs> all this forget, stuff happened like, to me. These characters are supposedly growing up in a certain kind of um, value system that mm -hmm. involves a ritual suicide as a more than likely end to one's life. Yeah, and, and we should and point out, too, that was Ito's job. I don't think we've mentioned that. That's his job before the story begins, is he assists people with ritual suicide when they can't do it themselves. He's the second mm -hmm. on, on seppuku. Is it seppuku? I'm going to get this wrong, so let me not try. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But there's, you know, if the ritual suicide, the the honor suicide, is a... Um, an extremely unpleasant move, you know, cutting open your stomach to drop your intestines out. If you can accomplish that, then there is someone to cut your head off to end your suffering. And if you can't, 
then there's someone to cut your head off to uh, keep you from being shamed and dishonored mm -hmm. by mm -hmm. crying. Yeah. That's not the guy <laughs> that you want to go framing. <laughs> okay. So let's go back to O'Rourke because uh, O'Rourke has some things to say that kind of pull together a bunch of what we just talked about. Yeah. O'Rourke talks about the importance of how Japan is represented in these stories and, and the actual historical, you know, whether it's accuracy or just our uh, narrativized version of what Japan was like. It, there's something important there because it's represented in English media in a way that it hasn't been before. Yeah. So O'Rourke writes that uh, you might disregard meditations on politics, good government, and the place of the individual as no longer relevant to the people of Japan. These questions, in fact, still permeate Japan in the very same way the legacies of our forebears influence and create the political culture of contemporary America. The legacies of the past are just as relevant to the Japanese as questions of loyalty to the state, family, and prescribed codes of behavior are relevant to any other nation. Moreover, much in the same way that Icon of the Cowboy is still a relevant manifestation of the American cultural milieu, so too the samurai in Japan is a significant cultural image that offers insight into modern behavior. So all of that to say, it is a period piece with an extraordinary um, uh, alien set of values, codes mm -hmm. of behavior. To but, us. To us but also probably to some modern Japanese. Yeah, that's probably fair. Same as you and I have some knowledge of what it might be like to be a cowboy, but also it right. just doesn't make any sense. The idea that someone might come to town and if they do it fairly, they can kill somebody. <laughs> yeah. 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 The red dead redemption of modern day America. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, O'Rourke basically makes the case that it is relevant because a societal critique and exploration is being channeled through the period piece. Mm -hmm. But we have Rollman to also mention that, Hey, some of that's bullshit too. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned this casually, but Rollman uh, sums it up here and says, look, lone wolf and cub contains female characters, but they're always secondary to the male characters. They assume a variety of roles. They could be warriors or assassins. Sometimes they're sex workers or housewives. On one hand, the author deserves credit because he creates some powerful female characters. And he also notes that Lady Snowblood was created by Koike. On the other hand, like most secondary characters in the series, they either end up getting killed off or sexualized violence is ubiquitous. Uh, this is absolutely true. This series, not just in the manga, but and when I was watching the, the Criterion Collection, my wife would be like cooking in the background or something. And she's like, oh, who's going to get raped in this one? Like, because every 30 minutes it was like somebody gets raped and then Lone Wolf and Cubs show up and they kill people. So this would only be better if Kelly was not wearing shoes and you were drinking a beer while all this was happening. Oof. Uh, yeah, I don't know that that's how it rolls in my house. It's usually <laughs> no, the other way around. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually the one not wearing shoes. But uh, yeah, so when I was reading it and the, the uh, female assassins, the set mm -hmm. of eight, the eight gates, it mm -hmm. was really obvious. And I imagine it might not have been at the time, you know, times change. But as soon as this story started and it was like, hey, here are a set of eight naked women Mm -hmm. being guided by a ninth naked woman through their ritual killing practice. I was like, Oh, I think, I think they don't need to be naked. I think that might be, I think that this might be gratuitous. There's, um, there's another storyline in the first volume that involves a woman who is really upset because her baby has died. And so he lets Daigoro breastfeed with her in order to console her, which right. seems extremely strange. Well, uh, now I, I do want to also add partly that's because she needed the pressure of the milk in her breasts to be lessened. Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, <laughs> it, it, we should remember this was a magazine that's target audience was young boys. Well, not young boys, young men, right? Yeah. Like between the ages of, I guess, high school and early twenties. So that dynamic was super simplified. 
Yeah. Um, there's another one in the first volume where uh, a bunch of like thugs are like, hey, uh, we're going to pay this prostitute to have sex with Lone Wolf. And uh, he has sex with her solely out of like he wants to make sure that she isn't killed by them. Yeah, she has a line that, oh, it is remarkable he will debase himself by sleeping with me to protect me. He will dishonor himself to make this whole situation okay. It was like, it yeah. was it, it was not quite revolting, but it was pretty close. There, There's just some, like, incredible links that the stories go to to justify uh, naked women or sex scenes or rape scenes. Well, I, and I should point out what I found revolting was the, the sort of creation of there is nothing about this man that is in any way inappropriate and everything about me, the woman who is, is telling you the story is, mm -hmm. is nothing is yeah. worse than nothing. Yeah. Within the context of the honor system. Yeah. Uh, and then Derek Johnston writes a piece about, about how it's an academic piece and there's a link to it in our show notes but it's essentially about how these japanese depictions in popular culture inform our american narratives of what japan's like especially based on how the english is translated yeah i mean there's that that kind of um god it's it's a weird form of bigotry to to make the the foreign culture in some way overdetermined and then sort of declare this is how they are mm. they have to follow this very fixed you know uh, cultural path it, you know not pointing out also that oh we have some cultural standards in America that people follow or not follow almost randomly you know, yeah. but then to say, oh, the honor system in uh, Japan is so rigid that these actions are inevitable. You know, vengeance is a coded uh, tradition uh, with with laws that are created by a feudal system. And so there's nothing about this that you should uh, question because it was, mm -hmm. you know, preordained by culture. Yeah, right. Like the the moral implications of it are beyond criticism as yeah. such. That that's sort of the the general idea. But he also points out that in the English language translations, and I'm guessing Johnston speaks Japanese, that uh there is a more hopeful tone to the way in which it's written, and that is not present in the Japanese versions. That the and we're about to roll into this talking about the themes, but it is incredibly nihilistic and bleak. The idea that he's just like, we are on the path of the demon. We are on our way to hell and we right. will do anything on our way there. You know, like there's no hopeful redemption arc yeah. for these guys. It's a revenge narrative and the sort of Western or American kind of addition to a re revenge narrative is that in some way you're ennobled yeah. or redeemed. But in this narrative, the revenge narrative is about how now we're locked into this terrible thing. You know, yeah, we're not going to fix the fact that your mom's dead, but we have to follow <laughs> yeah. this through to the end. Yeah, we're not going to find you a new mom. Uh, although she, he does apparently get to breastfeed with various women along the way. So <laughs> that leads us, I guess, in a very odd segue to talking about whether or not this is actually what qualifies as an epic in literature. I hadn't even thought about this, but this is part of the O'Rourke piece. And he points out uh, what the, you know, literary definition of an epic is and then how Lone Wolf and Cub qualifies. Yeah. So here are the characteristics of an epic. Large in scale, deals with important thematic issues, considers the socio-political reality of the culture and the individual's place in it, and the story must be popular and accepted by the intended audience. And O'Rourke says, that's Lone Wolf and Cub. So, uh, he points out, it definitely qualifies for the large and scale thing, based on how many issues and pages and volumes and yada yada. He says that Lone Wolf and Cub is longer than the Bible, which is an interesting point of comparison. 
uh, and that it is large in scope as well because it, quote, examines in great detail the political, social, and literal geography of Japan, exploring not just the world, but the worldview of the people at the time. Yeah, and we should say, I mean, it's it's not a defined year, but it is a defined time in yeah. Japanese history. Um, it's got It's got its own name, and it is when particular aspects of feudal Japan were in play. Um, I am going with 1672. Okay. <laughs> That's very specific. What's but... yours? What's your guess? Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> I, ju- I, I do have no idea. I, it's, it's funny. I kind of thought to myself, I'm like, I guess this could be in the 1600s, but it could also potentially be in the early 1800s. Like, they have guns. Yeah, that is the range that is defined by the cultural markers mm-hmm. I read is 1600 to 1850. Oh, okay. Somewhere okay. in there. Well, I'm going to say it's 1849 then. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. <laughs> An arbitrary and useless guess. <laughs> um, the other thing that O'Rourke points out is that it meets the secondary uh, criteria for an epic because it, it deals with such broad thematic issues, right? So we've talked about this already, but he lists them. Revenge, honor, loyalty, family, justice. Uh, some of them are throughout the entire story, and some of them are just the focus of these like little individual episodes that we see. Um, now, the person he turns to to define the epic is Timothy a, Shutt. Yeah, Timothy Shutt. And Timothy Shutt says the the main themes that an epic needs to have in order to qualify are love, death, and God. And they have to be contextualized as the presence or the absence of the divine within the lives of human beings. That seems so like rock bottom foundational. And yet... Yeah. It makes sense. Like, oh, yeah, if you're not actually engaging those ideas, you have a very different story than if you consider them from the sense of what do they mean? How do they change you? And does the divine exist? Yeah. In your uh, worldview and in your life. Um, when you think about these criteria, what, what book immediately comes to mind for you? Oh, uh, Nothing. I, nothing comes to mind. This is, I, I am oh. not framed in the understanding of ethics. Oh, okay. Now I'm going to give another bingo, uh, card piece to our listeners here. I immediately just assumed like, oh, it's the stand. Oh, gotcha. Okay. But, you know, I yeah, wonder that if makes, that's something that King was aware of when he was working sense. on it. And he's like, I got to check these four boxes. Well, probably right. Cause he, you know, studied English literature, the epic, mm, you know, yeah. the understanding of the epic is going to be in there. I mean, the one that keeps getting brought up here by O'Rourke is the Iliad and the Odyssey, but like a more present day contemporary thing to me, see, it seems like the stand qualifies. Anyways, uh, they, they also point out that the, the, the way that religion has to be depicted, this, this presence of the divine is uh, shown in Lone Wolf and Cub as being a crucial role for Ido's quest, right? Like, we haven't really talked a lot about this, but he sees it as like a divine quest, literally in the sense of that, like, he is purposely walking towards hell every yeah. step he takes on his journey. So you you mentioned this earlier. Um, it is uh, Ito understands himself as a demon of the Buddhist hell. Uh, Mia Fumato. And so this is not about, I am a person who is seeking revenge because I was wronged. This is a person who has been transformed from one position in a religious understanding of life mm-hmm. into a different position. And, uh, yeah. and O'Rourke, you know, kind of slams his home by saying a crucial aspect of the epic is illustrated in the individual's place in the world, often with a religious and spiritual framework. And so Lone Wolf and Cub is actually engaging that idea. Something as important as Achilles asking, you know, the gods or refuting the gods because of what happened to him and Mm. removing himself from the hero's position because of how he feels about uh, immediate events. 
We already mentioned that it fulfills the epic criteria of covering social norms and politics. But uh, O'Rourke points out something interesting here. This is a great paragraph that really uh, articulates one of the reasons why I like it. And I didn't have the words to be able to describe it. He says that the questions that are posed by the events in the story force the reader to confront and reflect upon the mythos of their own society. So like in the example of the Iliad, it forces you to consider the role of the average person in everyday society in comparison to, you know, the characters in the Iliad and how they're interacting with their gods and with the, their complex natures of fate. Yeah. Um, that That is something that I get out of Lone Wolf and Cub and maybe as part of the general kind of just like calming uh, ability <laughs> that this story has on me, despite well, is, how violent and sexist it is. Yeah. Well, this is what I was talking about when I tried to come up with a phrase and, and got cultural vertigo. Mm, mm -hmm. Right. Like Lone Wolf and Cub brought up my my Clint Eastwood fueled understanding of america and yeah. not because i mean it, it is connected in a way but more that i recognize that the way lone wolf and cub is being sort of thematically understood or created is similar to the way that a western like the good the bad and the ugly is thematically constructed or mm. created and so Lone Wolf and Cub is telling me something about Japan that I think that these Westerns are telling me about America, but they, I can't match them up. They're not the same despite having these yeah. superficial connections because of movies, you know, going across the ocean, Westerns coming from America to Japan and then back again. Right. But so again, like, I don't know a ton about uh, those movies, no, not nearly as much as you do. Uh, and I understand from previous episodes that you were very stoned when you watched those movies, but some of them aren't some they them. made by Italian creators? Yes, but not so all. Of them. What you're seeing is an Italian's idea of what American history is. Well, I mean, in particular, to an the American. spaghetti westerns certainly. Yeah, but the spaghetti westerns are not the only westerns. Okay, I see what you're saying. I thought you meant specifically. That trilogy of films. Well, when you talk about Clint Eastwood, yeah. Mm. So he starts as uh, the man with no name or Joe or Blondie or whatever, and he's being directed by Sergio Leone. But then Eastwood lays out his history of America, mm. you know, in everything from Joe Kidd, written by Elmer Leonard, up to Pale Rider, which is a re, uh, you know, reworking of Shane, yeah. all the way up to Unforgiven, which is the best Western ever those are probably more yeah like more uh synonymous with lone wolf and cub yeah totally okay and a lot of those are also revenge movies which this is pretty this much, is a revenge story as well pretty much anything i like is a revenge story <laughs> including a king crimson album did you know that the good place is a revenge story <laughs> Okay, maybe not everything I like, but yeah, revenge stories are um, out of proportion yeah. uh, in their representation and what I like. <laughs> I, I have to agree, <laughs> me too. Um, now, O'Rourke talks about this as well, that it is clearly a revenge story. That is probably why it is attractive, not just to us, but to young Japanese men. Uh, and he points out, he says, you can't just leave Lone Wolf and Cub at that definition. He says that would be a disservice. It's not just a tale of vengeance. It's also the tale of a father and a son. They're alone. They're at odds with a hostile world. It's also a drama about the unseen ties that unite us by blood and destiny. From another angle, you can look at this tale as a symbolic journey through Buddhist theology. So there's just a lot going on under the surface here, which is pretty fascinating when you think about the conditions that Koike and Kojima were producing this under like yeah they were just like oh yeah like this is a a like little comic strip that we're putting together for a men's magazine well the thing to remember is that it could have been a straight story of a man trying to find the person who wronged him and killing him it was complicated by the addition of a child you know traveling with him but they did not then rely on that 
to make the story interesting. Yeah. They relied on examining a time that was present to them, but maybe not uh, completely detailed. You know, just like when we think about Westerns, you know, the cowboy days are present in your mind, Mm. even if you were never a cowboy. Uh, And in doing that, they brought up so much more than just can a person be violent in answer to violence visited upon them and still mm-hmm. survive. Mm-hmm. You know, that revenge narrative is totally out the window with lone wolf and cub. Another one of the things that our work points out as being why it's not just a revenge story is because of the historical accuracy, the like attention to detail. Um, and Micheline Martin at Looper points out the story over the course of all these volumes touches almost every corner of Japanese society over its entire course. So they are interacting with farmers. They're interacting with sex workers. They're dealing with lords and homeless people. Like there's just an incredibly broad swath of human narratives. Yeah. Some of the details of the assassin um, jobs Mm. involve what uh, a particular area run by a particular Lord can do or what they can uh, deal with. You know, yeah. Who can move from space to space, who is allowed into public spaces, who is allowed to have money, who is, uh, who is able to connect with uh, other feudal areas, you know, all kinds of stuff. I don't understand it enough to really lay it out, but it's clear that, the medieval Japanese backdrop, as Hans Roman says, is uh, impeccably researched. It yeah. is coherent. And if they're faking, they're faking in such a way that I cannot possibly see the seams. Yeah. Right. Like it's like it's so <laughs> if it were faked and this history is not accurate, it would be such immaculate world building that it would almost qualify as creating an entire like new cultural history, (laughs) you know, it's, it's, I I just had this image of someone saying, well, that's what history is now. (laughs) History is now whatever (laughs) lone wolf and cub says. Um, I, I did not intend this, but I'm going to diverge real quick before we finish. Okay. I watched the man in the woods. Are we two paths? What's going on? Yeah. We're, I'm walking down the path of the demon (laughs) (laughs) as, as you would. I watched The Mandalorian in December, and it was fine. Um, And everybody's comparing it to Lone Wolf and Cub and saying why, you know, it's important to go back and look at Lone Wolf and Cub. When I think about all of the stuff we're learning in this episode about what makes Lone Wolf and Cub a quality epic. Yeah. The Mandalorian does not have any of this. (laughs) Like, it simply has the premise that there's a... A adult warrior accompanied by a child on his on like a, bounty a hunting mission. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. There's, I mean, there is a little bit of the religious stuff in that, um, they sort of explore the like religious honor of the Mandalorian culture in it, but it, it doesn't get at a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here thematically as being important. So does the Mandalorian have the, the path of the demon stuff, right? This is the most interesting. No, it does this, not. The yeah. most interesting thing about the um, the lone wolf and cub story, as a westerner reading a revenge narrative, it's very explicit about how um, none of this is good. None of yeah. this is. Uh, none of Ito's actions are to redeem anything Mm -hmm. right he is a he's disgraced uh i'm gonna go back to o'rourke to get like just the exact um understanding uh so o'rourke says throughout the historical evolution of the heroic archetype there are examples of warriors and leaders becoming the ideal example of the very thing that they had previously fought against or rejected people who fought gods only to become deities themselves rebellious sons who become their fathers and so on throughout time and then he says that Koike, by putting Lone Wolf and Cub in the position to uh, become the disgrace 
that has been visited upon him becomes a concept. He's yeah. not going to become the uh, betraying Lord that he's off to kill, but he becomes the reason that he must redeem himself. Like he becomes yeah. the actual um, uh, dishonorable event that happened to him. And he there does it in a completely competent and obsessive way yeah. while also recognizing that it is not something that one should be doing. He is using samurai skills and values for bad. And he is on a, um, a collision course with uh, his own destruction and his own continuous dishonor. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's ways in which you can look at some of these short stories and if you change the point of view, Ido is the bad guy. Like, he's a villain in some of these, the way he enters people's lives and just completely wrecks everything. And that's one of the things that's also kind of fascinating to me about it is the moral justifications that are placed in each of these stories, depending on the situations of, like, why he may be in the right, even if what he's doing is purposely being a bit of a villain because it's the path that he's been set upon by his villains. Well, it it highlights that the the idea of the outlaw is yeah. very particular to a society. Like, um, <laughs> I just I just had Nicolas Cage something pop into my head from Raising Arizona. Uh, look at him; he's a little outlaw, you know, like. <laughs> The kind of delight in, oh, I've got a rogue or a scoundrel on my uh -huh. side. Han Solo. Uh, you know, who, whoever you want to pop up with, like someone who goes against society, goes against um, the rules, mm -hmm. and is thus free and ad admirable and successful as a person. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny that you bring up Han Solo because of the Mandalorian thing again, right? Like, Well, yeah. And also, like, Hidden Fortress being George yeah. Lucas's kind of instigating uh film uh film viewing for star mm -hmm. wars like it's all mixed up it's it's uh you know these samurai films influenced a set of filmmakers in america who then like made explicit changes in how we think of cultures yeah and flipped the end result of these samurai stories where uh, disgrace or dishonor must be met with further disgrace or dishonor to create a balance without redeeming anybody. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they bring up here, you mentioned this earlier, but the, the 47 Ronin, which is the legend is referred to as the 47 loyal retainers. Uh, O'Rourke says, this is a, a story of precedence in Japanese history. It is definitely something that influenced Koike on some level. Uh, it might be embellished, but it's appeared in every possible medium in Japan. In fact, uh, I'm pretty sure 47 Ronin has also been adapted into English language comics, probably by Dark Horse at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is, this is kind of a, a cultural touchstone, especially in Japan. And let's, um, let's use our work to really like, uh, explain this. For the followers of Bushido, which is samurai practice, in the era of pre-modern Japan, to be a masterless samurai, a ronin, was a sign of shame. In a society that valued loyalty and subservience to the death, and where the entrenched code of the warrior was zealously imposed on the samurai class from birth, the prospect of being denied the opportunity to serve one's lord was a truly terrible fate. Mm -hmm. So when your lord, when, you know, your boss is killed as a samurai, you are then supposed to kill yourself. Mm -hmm. If you don't, in order to avenge the death of your lord, you are not doing the right thing. You are compounding the problem that this, uh, this act of violence on your lord has caused. And so to revenge the death of your leader you have to continue the uh, the problem, the disruption that that death has caused. Instead mm -hmm. of, I think, American revenge narratives, which is things are out of balance. 
because someone has hurt me or hurt people I love, and now they must be hurt back so that everything is okay again. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, there's no sense of that here, right? And probably, I think if you like go through the entire Lone Wolf and Cub series, you will find that like he kills far more people than like would uh, weigh the balance <laughs> right. of, of his uh, dishonor. And he does not seem to care. No. Yeah. And and that is something I think that is pretty unique to this. Uh, we were talking in a recent Super King Context episode about the Dark Tower and how uh, all the adaptations of it struggled with the idea of this sort of irredeemable protagonist who oh, yeah. really doesn't care. And also Lone Wolf and Cub influenced in that it's an adult wandering around with a kid. Right. Yeah. But in, And he's a cowboy. Yeah. But, but then um, he kills the kid. So it's a very different... <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's in the book, right? And that is very Lone Wolf and Cub. Whereas, um, the the, the movie version was like, oh no, it's got to be hopeful, and like yeah. we can't possibly have him be this just such an incredibly dark nihilistic character. And so that's where, like, I kind of wonder, like, all these conversations about how, like, oh, we're going to adapt Lone Wolf and Cub. I don't know how that's going to quite work out uh, if it's done for the American movie market. You know, by not taking it to the end and uh, highlighting the stuff that's cool, not the stuff that's important. Yeah, you're right. It should just be an expanded universe of samurai movies. Uh, <laughs> now, that brings us to one last thing that O'Rourke points out about the... Uh, is This a long-running, what he calls a meme in books and movies that involve samurai. But it's it's something I already mentioned that's part of Lone Wolf and Cub, which is that the idea of how the character fights is essential to understanding the character themselves. So like yeah. by watching how Ido fights, it helps you understand his motivation or his uh, various antagonists, you know, whether it's the uh, naked lady assassins or it's, you know, the exotic weapon fighting guys that just show up on the road at certain points yeah, or the um townspeople in a, a mob rushing mm. you know ito and then he in gunslinger style just kills a town mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um o'rourke points out that this is something that's naturally found in lone wolf and cub and that uh we learn not just about ito but about all these different types of personalities that the uh, different ways in which people are interpreting Bushido as a code of honor. And uh, there's points where Ido is able to figure out how to defeat his opponents solely based on like how they hold their weapon or what kind of weapon they're using. Um, and, and so it's interesting. Uh, O'Rourke points out and says that for the skilled warrior fighting styles are actually signifiers that are a complicated and unspoken language that's known only to the initiated. So you've got this kind of other language that's going on underneath the surface of this story. And that's one of the things that I think people, and myself included, find super cool about stories like this. Like how how badass is that? That you've got your, your hero character who's a warrior and uh, can look at someone and say, oh... I see that they'll be using this style, like like uh, the Princess Bride, like the whole sword fight where they talk about the styles they're using and they recognize each other and mm -hmm. the whole I'm not left handed either is super cool. But yeah. in the Princess Bride, it ends with him knocking out his vanquished foe and saying, I would no sooner kill you than I would uh, destroy a stained glass window or whatever it is. Whereas Lone Wolf and Cub is set up that the reason that Ito has to be a badass and understand the fighting style of anyone he meets is because he kind of has to kill anyone he meets maybe because yeah. he is, he's the, a demon. He is the worst thing that many people are going to meet. And yet he's still our hero. You've been listening to super context, a podcast autopsy of media, how it's made and how it informs our everyday culture. 
Our theme music is Human Factor by Mile Marker. And right now you're listening to Drive Fast by Three Chain Links. Show notes and all our past episodes are available at supercontextpodcast.libson.com. You can email the show at supercontextpodcast at gmail.com to tell us what you like, what you don't like, and to suggest topics for future shows. And I'm available on Twitter as at Christian Sager. And I'm there at Bennett Radio. Two N's, two T's.